اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ اللہ ہدانا لہذا و ما کنا لنحتدی لولا ان ہدان اللہ اشد اللہ الہ الا اللہ وحدہ لا شریک له و اشد ان محمد عبده و رسوله ارسل رسوله بالہدا و دین الحق لیز حرہ الدین کل ولو کرہ المشرکون اما بعد قال اللہ تعالی فی کتاب الکریم اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم من اجل ذالک کتبنا علی بنی اسرائیل انہ من قتل نفسا بغیر نفس او فساد فی الارض فَكَأَنَّمَا قَتَلَ النَّاسَ جَمِيعًا وَمَنْ أَحْيَاءَ فَكَأَنَّمَا أَحْيَاءَ النَّاسَ جَمِيعًا وَلَقَدْ جَاءَتْهُمْ رُسُلَنَا بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ ثُمَّا إِنَّا كَسِيرًا مِّنْهُمْ بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ فِي الْأَرْضِ لَمُسْرِفُونَ صدق اللہ العظیم Committed Muslims, Brothers, Sisters and children in Islam. This ayat from Surah Al-Ma'idah, ayat number 32, is addressed to the Bani Israel, but it also applies to us today. And in this ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us about the sanctity of and sacredness of human life. Allah says, and a rough translation of this ayat is, Because of this did we ordain unto the children of Israel that if anyone slays a human being, unless it be in punishment for murder, that means somebody who has committed murder, then obviously the punishment for that is that the person must face the death penalty or for spreading corruption on earth. Corruption on earth actually can be sedition, turmoil in society, treason against legitimate authority. If somebody kills a person outside these two conditions, Allah says it is as if they have killed the whole of humanity. And then the opposite point of view is also highlighted that if somebody were to save even one life, it would be as if that person has saved the whole of humanity. And then Allah says, and indeed there came unto them our apostles, our messengers, with all evidence of the truth. Bayinat. Yet, behold, notwithstanding all this, many of them go on committing all manner of excesses on earth. Now, while this particular ayat is referring to the sanctity of human life and how important it is to protect innocent human life, we know when we look around the world that there are people in positions of power and authority that think that they have a license to kill innocent human beings by the millions because they have become so arrogant and so intoxicated by their power, that is physical power, that they think that they have the right to decide who lives and who dies. If we reflect on the last 20 years of our existence on earth, we find that at least 25 million people have been killed only in the last 20 years. And the overwhelming majority of these people are Muslims. We know such countries as Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Palestine, 
and people in places like Kashmir or Myanmar have either been killed or expelled from their homes. Many of these societies have been totally destroyed. And it appeared 20 years ago that perhaps there would be absolutely no stop to this mass slaughter of humanity by these arrogant powers. They have used missiles, they have used drones, they have used their air forces and their navy and ground forces and all kinds of other weapons to destroy innocent human life. Funeral processions have been targeted. Wedding ceremonies have been targeted. People's homes have been destroyed. Their farms and orchards have been destroyed. Human life has literally been rendless, rendered useless. And it appeared that there would be no end to this turmoil. And yet, sincere Muslims continue to struggle and strive in the way of Allah for their fundamental rights. Now, the one power, the one arrogant power that was at the forefront of this mass destruction and killings by the millions of human beings, we find today has been rendered totally impotent. Impotent by a brainless virus that has infected more than 20 million of its inhabitants and has resulted in the death of at least 380,000 of its citizens. That's more than the number of its citizens that are killed just in one year that were killed in the entire five-year war during the Second World War. And if we go back into history, all of the wars since the beginning of the last century that this arrogant power participated in, not as many of its citizens were killed during all of those wars, excluding, of course, the Second World War, and up to the present time, then have been killed in just one year time by this virus. Second, we also witnessed recently an actual insurrection in the heart of its capital city. One of the pillars of its government was attacked and today this arrogant power is deeply divided. In fact, these divisions are so deep that perhaps it may not recover from the blows that have been delivered and that will be delivered in the coming days and weeks and months. So what we witness is that those that perpetrate zulm, oppression and tyranny on the face of this earth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a day appointed for them, to deal with them. When we study the Noble Qur'an, we see that in the past there were other powers like Namrud and Fir'aun who said to the prophets that went to them, to Ibrahim salam and to Musa salam, they said, we give life and we give death. We decide who lives and who dies. And yet we know what happened to them. But Namrud and Fir'aun are not just figures from history. These are mindsets that should remind us that even today, Namrud-like personalities, Fir'aun-like personalities exist today. And so long as Allah's committed servants continue to strive and struggle against these tyrannical powers, with whatever they have at their command, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ultimately bring them to triumph. When we consider the attitude of these tyrannical powers, their behavior is worse than beasts in the jungle. 
even beasts in the jungle do not kill at such mass scale. A beast, whether it's a lion or a leopard or a tiger, it would only kill to satiate its hunger. It will not go on a mass killing spree. It's only human beings that are capable of indulging in such conduct when they kill other human beings by the millions without any regard to the sanctity of life. Now, we as Muslims have a responsibility to not only understand these issues but to ask ourselves what is our role in this struggle. One of the aspects that unfortunately many Muslims take refuge in is rituals. For instance, there are Muslims that think that just because they pray or they fast or they go for Hajj, etc., or they uh, do extra uh, nawafil, etc., or they recite many du'as, that that's all that is required of them. These rituals are important. We should not belittle them. But Islam has a higher calling on us as Muslims. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us, and this is in Surah Al-Baqarah, when he says, A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim Laysa al-birra an tuwallu wujuhakum qibal al-mashriq wal-maghrib Walakin al-birra man amana billahi wal-yawm al-akhir Wal-malaikati wal-kitabi wal-nabiyyin وآت المال على حبه ذوي القربى واليتامى والمساكين وابن السبيل والسائلين وفي الرقاب وأقام الصلاة وآت الزكاة والموفون بعهدهم إذا آهدوا والصابرين في الباساء والدراء وحين البعص أولئك الذين صدقوا وأولئك هم المتقون A rather long ayat from Surah Al-Baqarah but right at the beginning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us that you will not achieve bir, which bir means righteousness. Less al birra an tuwallu wujuhakum qibal al mashriq wal maghrib. You will not achieve righteousness by facing your faces towards the east or the west. Of course, this ayat was revealed in the context of the change of the qibla that occurred in the second year of the hijra in Medina. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us that simply rituals are not enough. That we are not going to achieve righteousness by simple rituals. Now let's pursue this ayat carefully. When Allah says, لَيْسَ الْبِرَّ أَن تُوَلُّوا وُجُوهَكُمْ قِبَلَ الْمَشْرِقِ وَالْمَغْرِبِ وَلَكِنَّ الْبِرَّ مَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَالْمَلَائِكَةِ وَالْكِتَابِ وَالنَّبِيِّينَ so the five articles of faith have been enunciated, our faith commitment to Allah and belief in the day of judgment, the Akhirah, the day of Akhirah, and the angels that we believe that there are angels that take record of our accounts, that there are books that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent, and the messengers and the prophets that Allah sent. But the ayat or the portion of the ayat that follows after that is extremely interesting and important. And Allah says, وَآتَ الْمَالَ عَلَىٰ حُبِّهِ And Allah reminds us that the wealth that we have accumulated and we love so much. So what should we do with it? ذَوِ الْقُرْبَى وَالْيَتَامَى وَالْمَسَاكِينَ وَابْنَ السَّبِيلِ وَالسَّائِلِينَ وَفِي الرِّقَابِ the seven categories that have been identified or seven kinds of people that we are supposed to help. And only then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about salat and zakat. So Allah says, mala ala hubbihi zawil qurba. So who do you give this wealth to? The wealth that you love, zawil qurba, your near relatives that are poor, that are 
in difficulty, financial difficulty. So our first responsibility to our near and dear. The will qurba wal yatama, orphans, wal masakin, people that are indigent, people that are in need, wabn sabil travelers, those that may be uh, in today's parlance, they could be refugees. Wasa ilina wa firrikab. People that are forced to beg and people that are in debt or difficult financial difficulties for whatever reasons. Allah says that you will achieve righteousness if you help these people. And those that are in debt can be in a whole lot of dif different ways or bondage or whatever. And then say Allah says, وَأَقَامَ الصَّلَاةَ وَآتَ zakat." And then the aspect of Salat and uh, Zakat comes in. In fact, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again reminds us, in, and this is in Surah Ali Imran, أَوْذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ Allah says that you are not going to achieve the righteousness unless and until you spend out of that that you love. And very often we as Muslims or human beings in general become too attached to the dunya. We become too attached to our material possessions, the wealth that we acquire, the wealth that we earn, which is a blessing from Allah. We think it is because of our own smartness or our own intelligence and whatever we have earned, even if it is by legitimate means, and of course for Muslims it has to be legitimate means, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that you are not going to achieve righteousness unless you spend of this wealth in the way of Allah. And where is it that Allah reminds us to spend it? Again, in the Noble Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us, A'udhu billahi minash shaitwanir rajeem, Ya ayyuhal lazina amanu hal adullukum ala tijaratin tunjikum min azabin alim. Tu'minuna billahi wa rasulihi wa tujahiduna fi sabilillahi bi amwalikum wa anfusikum. Now consider this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his infinite mercy, uh, he is the one who has provided everything for us, our wealth, our health, our families, our possessions, our homes, everything that we have is a grace, is the grace and mercy of Allah. It is not because we are too smart. It is because it is Allah's grace and mercy upon us. And yet, consider this ayat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Ya ayyuhal amanu hal adullukum ala tijaratin tanjikum min azabin alim. Allah is addressing this very, very special category of people. Allazina amanu. It's a very, very interesting expression used about 89 or 90 times in the Noble Quran. And whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to give us any directions, He addresses us by this expression, Allah zina amanu. We are all Muslims, but nowhere in the Noble Quran has Allah addressed us as, Ya ayyuhal zina aslamu. O you who have conformed or submitted to Allah. Allah has always addressed us as, Ya ayyuhal zina amanu. Now, Amanu is a very, very special category of Muslims. These are Muslims that have made their covenant with Allah that they will do what Allah commands them to do. So Allah says, O oh, you covenant-bearing Muslims, let me offer you a deal. Let me offer you a trade-off that will save you from the torment, from the great torment of hellfire. Ya ayyuhal lazina amanu hal adullukum ala tijaratin tunjikum min azabin alim. And what is the, the trade-off that Allah is offering us? 
تؤمنون بالله ورسوله that you make a faith commitment to Allah and his messenger وتجاهدون في سبيل الله بأموالكم that you strive and struggle in the way of Allah first with your wealth and then with your lives ذلكم خير لكم إن كنتم تعلمون this is better for you if only you knew so Allah is reminding us that whatever we have whatever we have acquired in our lives if we spend this in the way of Allah we struggle and strive in the way of Allah first with our wealth and then ultimately we might even be called upon to offer our lives for the sake of Allah and remember our life is an amana from Allah it is a trust and that is why those Muslims that die in the way of Allah are referred to as shaheed, martyrs. And shaheed, of course, is linked to the word shahada, testimony. So those people that achieve shahada are actually testifying with their blood to the commitment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we, the committed Muslims, have an obligation to strive and struggle in the way of Allah with our wealth and with our lives. And then we can hope for Allah's mercy and compassion and victory. And inshallah, victory is near. Aqawlu qawli haza, astaghfirullah li wa lakum, wa li sa'ir al-muslimina wal-muslimina.